Well, we found some older things than the Battle of Kings Mountain. Uh, one fellow came in and pointed out from our back deck where he lived, and his father had found a Spanish sword handle. And as you probably know, in Burke County, the, um, uh, the folks have unearthed a Spanish city that is the oldest community in, the, in North America that is little known. But the Spaniards were in the area, and DeSoto came through the area. I think it was uh, 1543 when he came through. And this sword probably dates from that time. But older than that, a park ranger recently found along the parkway, about four or five miles from our place, along the crest of the Blue Ridge, a 9,500-year-old arrowhead. So the prehistoric Indians were there. And we're pretty sure that before that, the buffalo would have used the Shallow Mountain Trail to get over the Continental Divide to the grazing lands on either side. So the geography of the area has played a big role in the history. Down here at the corner is McKinney Gap, and that's the low point in the Continental Divide. And that low point is named for Charlie McKinney, who was the first landholder here. The records date back to 1790. At its peak, Charlie held about 1,200 acres, and all the land that is orchard land now was on Charlie's holding. But Charlie's better known because with his four wives, they produced 48 children. Now, four wives is what we can find in the census. His kin now will tell you it was closer to seven wives and 70 children. But four wives and 40 children, 48 children will do for this story. Charlie's first two wives were sisters named Lowry, or as it said locally, Larry. The Larry sisters were the first two. The third one was a midwife nurse named Hobson. I'll let you cut this if you want. No, well, I mean, I'm going to tell you a story that you may want to cut out. Okay. We won't. <laughs> the, the first two wives were Lowry's. The third was a midwife nurse named Hobson. And as I tell these stories on my hayride, one rather irreverent lady said, Hmm, I'll bet that nasty old man had his eye on that midwife when she was delivering those first two women. Could be. The fourth wife was named Nancy Triplett. Granny Nancy's great-grandchildren came into the orchard house and told me stories about Charlie's uh, wife, Nancy. Nancy had a little house along our road. We don't know exactly where the house is. We still know where Charlie is buried, but we don't know where the house was. But it was such a small house that her great-grandchildren actually told me that she would clear the dishes off the table at night and set them down outside the back door to make more room in the house for the kids. Well, I have pu pu puzzled about that, and I believe she did do that, but I don't think it had anything to do with kids. You see, I think she appreciated the fact that in the morning those dishes would be clean. Every night she heard wild animals slurping and slopping in her dishes, and one night she heard an especially scary sound out there, and she wasn't sure what it was, and she opened the door and she held up the lantern and looked out back, Everybody guesses she saw a bear, and we see bear every month at the orchard. But it was not a bear Granny Nancy saw. If anything, it was worse. It was a mountain lion. Carolina Panther it was. That frightened her. She slammed the door, put a bar in the door, made the kids get up in the loft where they'd be safe if that panther got inside. Then, since it was not her husband Charlie's night to spend in that house with that wife, she started hollering for Charlie, who heard and came running with the gun and the dogs, chased away the panther, saved Miss Nancy, and all the children was a hero. Sort of. See, Mr. Charlie had all four families at the same time in four separate houses along the road there. And there was some jealousy, I understand, that some thought that one wife had more panther attacks than the others. Charlie would take all these children and all these wives to church. And at church, the man that wrote about him, uh, Uncle Jake Carpenter, wrote a book called The Book of the Dead. He said at church weren't nothing said about the way he lived. 
And they'd go home, and wherever Charlie was staying, that's where they'd have Sunday dinner. All the wives, all the children, and again, Uncle Jake said, they got along so well, there weren't no hair pulling. I'm assuming the double negative was not intended. Well, one of his great-granddaughters on the hayride said, well, you could always tell where Charlie was staying. And I said, how? And she said, well, he had this bear skin, or maybe it was a goat skin, I don't know, sheep skin. But it was his bedroll, and he would roll that thing up into a wad, and he would throw it in the front door of the house he expected to stay in. And I got a big kick out of the image of that old patriarch flinging that bedroll around. I started telling that story. And it wasn't two weeks before another one of his granddaughters said, tell the rest of the story. I don't know anymore. She said, well, I do. The wives had the option of throwing that bedroll out if they didn't want Mr. Charlie in there. So this irreverent lady said, oh, bedroll was just foreplay. Well, she also said, four wives, 48 children, four houses. I bet that old man had help. One of the favorite stories of Charlie McKinney is one about his hats. One time he wanted to get hats for all his children. Now, I know I told you that I'm telling absolute truth about all these stories, but here I'm going to deviate just a little bit with the proper footnote. And that is, this story is told various ways by Charlie's offspring. One tells it that he just took his boys to get hats. But I like it better if he took all 48 of his children to get these hats. He walked down the Yellow Mountain Trail we talked about, down to the town of Marion. Probably took him a day and a night and another day to get there. He left all the children out in the street and he walked into Mr. Blanton's general store. Now, Charlie McKinney died in 1850s at about age 80. So this would have probably been in the early 1800s. Those children are out in the street. Blanton can't see him. He walks up to Mr. Blanton and he says, Mr. Blanton, I want to buy 48 hats. You're going to sell those hats, aren't you? You're going to make money on this deal. I'm not going to sell those hats to you. I'll sell them to your customers and I'll make more money. Charlie said, oh, no, sir, I'm not going to sell those hats. Those hats are for my 48 children. Bad gummit, now I know you're not telling me the truth. Nobody has 48 children. Charlie said, I do. Mr. Blanton said, okay, then, Mr. Mountain Man, if you can show me 48 children, I will give you 48 hats. That was a bad promise. Out in the street they went, and what did they see? 48 children. It was the worst day of stingy old Mr. Blanton's whole life. He was either going to have to break his promise or he was going to have to break his own heart by giving away 48 hats. Mr. Blanton did the right thing and he gave Charlie McKinney 48 hats. And that's how the old mountain farmer outsmarted the stingiest storekeeper there's ever been in all of Marion. Now, I tell that story sometimes, and I tell it in Marion, and I've always had my heart on my sleeve because there might be some Blantons in the audience who might take exception to that. But I'm always careful to point out that Mr. Blanton did the right thing. Those are some of the stories of Charlie. There are a lot more Charlie stories. There's one that's I usually tell people as they're leaving if they're on a bus, and I can get on the bus and tell this told you Charlie was a church-going man, and he went to church everywhere he went. And if he found himself in Virginia on Sunday, he would go to church, which he did one day up there. And he sat down next to this beautiful young lady. Charlie seemed to have a knack for that. And he struck up a conversation with her, and he said, Tell me, child, who is your mother? And she said, Oh, sir, uh, She's, my mother's dead. And Charlie, who claimed that this young lady looked a lot like his mother, said, well, then, who is your father? And she said, I don't know, sir. I've never met him, but they say his name is Charlie McKinney. So Charlie had, uh, uh, well, he may have had family lots of other places. We don't know. But the thing about Charlie that is unique 
in addition to having a large family like this, is he took equal care of his family. And when he died, he left his holdings to those four wives in equal measure. And he always, as a farmer, was able to provide for these families. And many times in the mountains, cereal families were what men did instead of having them all at the same time. And so in my, by my lights, even though he had a very peculiar lifestyle by modern standards, Charlie was a hero of his time. Charlie McKinney.